Hello, everyone. This is Richard from Modern Health Span. A common view is that the amount of protein that we can absorb and utilize for protein synthesis at one time is limited to about 20 or 30 grams. This view then proposes that the remaining amino acids are burnt to provide fuel. This recent paper has called this view into question and instead proposes that there is no upper limit of protein that can be utilized, at least up to 100 grams. Let's have a look at the paper and what they found. The current belief is that as protein intake increases, anabolism, the building of new protein, peaks and the excess protein is oxidized and used for fuel. This is shown in principle in this graph. However, there is limited scientific evidence for this. This study was developed to investigate this further. In the experiment, the participants performed a standardized bout of resistance training and were subsequently given a drink containing either 0, 25, or 100 grams of protein, in which the leucine and phenylalanine had been labeled with carbon-13. They picked 100 grams as the largest reasonable amount of protein that would be consumed in a single sitting. They also included an infusion of stable amino acid traces. This is part of the process required to measure muscle protein synthesis. There were frequent blood draws to record the level of amino acids in the plasma, and they performed a muscle biopsy every four hours. From the results, the new understanding proposed by the authors is that anabolism continues to increase linearly with more protein. Although the amino acid oxidation also increases, it does so at a much lower rate. The anabolism also continues longer with a larger dose. Some details about the study. It was a one-time experiment. There were 36 healthy male participants aged between 18 and 40 years old. They were randomly divided into three groups, one on a placebo, one on 25 grams of protein, and one on 100 grams of protein. The exclusion criteria made sense, though I found this one interesting. The participants had to do more than one, but less than three sports or exercise sessions per week. The exercise protocol seemed to have been quite hard work. Three sets of 10 reps at 80% of one rep max across four exercises, leg press, leg extension, lat pull down and chest press. And it looks like they aim to push the participants to failure. To generate the labeled milk protein, they infused the labeled molecules into a cow, then extracted the protein from the milk. After the participants performed the resistance training, a blood draw was done and they were then given the protein drink. Every four hours, they took a biopsy, and more frequently, they took blood draws. Here are the graphs for the amino acid presence in the blood over the 12 hours of the study. Both the 25 and the 100 group saw spikes in the total amino acids, though the 25 group was back to steady state after six hours, while the 100 group continued to see an excess above baseline until 12 hours. This was also true of phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is used as a marker of muscle protein synthesis, as it is an essential amino acid, which is not oxidized by muscle tissue. And leucine, the amino acid most closely associated with muscle protein synthesis. Where were the excess amino acids coming from? And did the ingested protein reduce the level of protein catabolism? These graphs are looking at those questions. The top one shows the total appearance of new amino acids. The second one, those that are labeled as coming from the drink with the carbon-13. And the bottom graph is those that are endogenous, which is to say they came from the body. We can see that all the difference is accounted for by the exogenous amino acids. The endogenous amino acid is also a measure of catabolism, that is, protein breakdown, in the body. Interestingly, this did not decrease with the external protein intake, which might have been expected. The second set of graphs show the rate of disappearance of the amino acids, which is a measure of the level of protein synthesis. We can see that this increases in a dose-dependent manner and does not appear to reach saturation. The last column is the total protein synthesis, which increases in a dose-dependent manner. The second graph shows the rate of amino acid oxidation, that is, the amount of amino acids which are being burnt as fuel. This shows a minimal increase with the larger protein dose, but it is negligible compared to the protein synthesis, 
and the protein net balance increases to a greater degree and for longer with the larger dose, as well as confirming the extended availability of amino acids in the blood. They checked whether this led to continued muscle protein synthesis. These graphs show the fractional synthetic rate, FSR, a measure of the percentage of amino acids being incorporated into muscle and hence of muscle protein synthesis. The MPS of the 100 group was roughly 20% higher than that of the 25 group in the first four hours, but increased to 40% higher by the 12th hour. They looked for the expression of markers of anabolism and catabolism. Despite the amino acids being present and continued muscle protein synthesis, they did not see a significant difference in the expression of mTOR or a couple of autophagy-related enzymes, ATG12 and Becklin. Previous research has shown that the metabolic response is short-lived and would have returned to baseline by the fourth hour mark. Here is a conceptual graph of some of the key metrics related to the metabolism. Anabolic sig signaling, that is the expression of anabolic proteins, such as mTOR, is shown in green, peaks here and is back to almost baseline by the four hour mark. Muscle protein synthesis and whole body protein synthesis also peak quickly, but then continue to be above baseline, with the whole body protein synthesis being down to baseline at 12 hours, but muscle protein synthesis continuing further. The study only lasted for 12 hours, so beyond that is unknown. Meanwhile, the metabolic signaling and whole body muscle breakdown remained at baseline throughout. They looked at the total protein incorporated into muscle tissue during the study. 18% of the 25 grams for a total of 45 grams was incorporated by 12 hours, while 13% of the 100 grams was incorporated for 13 grams total. These percentages are quite high when compared to other studies. The authors attribute this to the exercise done immediately before the study. They do mention in the limitations that the final number might have been more as the muscle synthesis was still going on at 12 hours, and they would presumably have continued for some period after. A couple of points from the discussion section that I wanted to go through. The study used whole milk protein, which consists of 20% whey and 80% casein. Whey is very quickly absorbed, but casein is not. It clots in the acid of the stomach and can take up to four or five hours to absorb. So it is possible the extended time is because the protein is still in the gut and was absorbed over a period. However, the authors felt that this was not the case based on previous evidence and seeing no difference in the MPS rate, rates which might have been expected from the mix of the two proteins. I am not clear on where the amino acids are coming from, if not the delayed absorption from the gut. But this may be a closer model to eating real food. For example, I looked up the rate of protein absorption from food sources such as beef, chicken, or fish, and all are the same rate or slower than casein. The authors do mention that this would imply that this could be a reason why we do not see muscle loss with intermittent feeding. As we mentioned, there was a lack of change in the expression of mTOR and autophagy-related proteins, despite the large amount of protein consumed. I am not sure what the implications of this are. We should have a look at the declaration of interests. One of the authors is an employee of Friesland Campina, which is a dairy company that I guess makes milk protein products such as whey or casein. However, they say that they had not, nothing to do with the study or even the funding. I am not clear on everything in the paper, particularly how mTOR is not active or autophagy downregulated with the amino acid availability and whether the extended period of muscle synthesis is because of slow absorption from the gut or for some other reason. However, it does show greater muscle synthesis with a higher dose of protein. And for most forms of protein, it seems reasonable to expect an extended time of anabolism and would imply that you don't need to spread your protein out over the day. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all well.